Hello everyone, welcome to today's session, Beyond Entitlements for the Cloud Native. A quick disclosure from my workplace. Hi, my name is Chandra, I work at BNY Mellon in the Java Platform Engineering. I am one of the representatives of BNY Mellon in the Java Community Process Executive Committee. I'm a Java champion, a Java leader at two Java user groups, and a speaker at a few technology conferences. Today we'll cover responsibility management through some scenarios and use cases that explain the need for it, we will investigate a few common solutions that exist both for data and logic, and then we will describe and visualize the right solution after that. Then we'll jump into architecture. We will take a look at a few technology choices that we evaluated. We will cover two different architecture patterns that we built and, and used, and we'll do a comparison between the two to see which one worked better for us. This will be followed by a sample policy in action using this solution that we came up with. We will wrap this session with an IDE productivity tool that we built and heavily use. Let's get started. So responsibility management, let's take a quick look at the background and existing solutions. We'll start with a few scenarios. In scenario one, you have a service that needs to know if a user is a member of an enterprise LDAP group, LDAP standing for lightweight directory access protocol. Access may be granted or denied based upon membership, or access may be granted or denied based upon lack of membership. The service would simply connect to an LDAP and clear this information. What if there was another service that needed to know if a user was a member of some other LDAP group? Would they also connect to LDAP directly? What if there are multiple services that needed this? Who manages users who move, leave, or join the department, organization, or company? Such users are commonly known as movers, leavers, and joiners. The second scenario, very similar to the first, the service needs to know if a user is a member of an enterprise active directory or email group. Access, once again, may be granted or denied based upon membership or lack thereof. What if multiple services require the same kind of access for different active directory groups? Who manages movers, leavers, and joiners in such a situation? The third scenario is a bit more complex. Here, a service needs to check that all of the below conditions are actually valid. The, the user is a member of some LDAP group, but is not a member of some other LDAP group. The user is a member of some email group, has some fiscal power and has some HR responsibilities. The question that I are very similar is what if each request is for different sets of groups and amounts? What if other services have similar functional constraints? Such functional constraints are commonly referred to as policies. Where are these policies maintained? Are these policies auditable? Do they follow SDLC and configuration management guidelines set about in your organization? And once again, who manages the movers, leavers, and joiners? The fourth scenario is a bit more finer grained compared to the first three. Here, there is a specific context provided, and the service needs to check responsibility privileges for a user when one or many of the below contextual attributes. The first one being a domain, which is like a line of business, a business unit, etc. The second could be a cost code identifier, which holds the budgetary amount for your given domain or, or department, etc. It could be for a specific environment that the user is operating in, and for a specific action that the user is trying to perform, and on a specific resource the user may be performing this action on. Now, it doesn't have to be everything. It could be a subset or, or some more contextual information similar to this. Great. What are the questions that arise? What if each request is for different sets of values uh, for the given domain? What if there are other services that have similar functional constraints with different values or different domains? Who manages the role responsibility, which is nothing but a mapping of responsibilities to an individual role, and user role mappings, which is a mapping of a user to a given set of roles. Who manages mover, lever, and joiner logic? These were the scenarios. Let's look at, take a look at common solutions that exist today. We will break this into two parts. There is a data portion and a logic portion, as we've already seen. Let's first tackle data. Data is commonly referred to as reference or static data, and it is used for evaluation. For integrated services such as LDAP or Active Directory, these are typically queried by the application or service via direct connections. For more corporate data, such as a user's approver or a user's manager, they could be queried through some proprietary corporate directory services made available. A role responsibility mapping and user role mapping storage is commonly in a local persistence, or if it exists, a proprietary system that holds this data for you. These were the different common solutions that we encountered for data. Let's take a look at logic. Logic is calculations or functions commonly referred to as policies. In the past, common functions and calculations were coded directly into an application or service. 
Newer applications and services tend to separate these out as an independent microservice or service. Some applications could use embedded rules engines such as Drools, and some applications utilize proprietary entitlement systems should your organization cater to that. These are some common solutions for data and functions. What do we want? We are looking for a solution to manage dynamic privileges and entitlements across the organization in a cohesive manner. How do you go about doing that? You are looking for a right solution. Let us describe the right solution. A responsibility management system is one that can federate calls to LDAP, Active Directory and other integrated services. It can provide for roles and responsibility mapping for you. It should provide for a user role mapping for you and it should provide for a proper SDLC and audit mechanism so you know who did what, when and why. In addition, a responsibility management system should provide for a policy engine that can evaluate complex calculations. There are typically three elements that are included in this evaluation. There is data that is provided ad hoc by the service during the request and could be different for each request. And there is data that is available through integrated services. This is commonly referred to as reference data or static data. And then there are the policies themselves which are provided by the domains. The responsibility management system additionally should cater to mover lever joiner logic and especially in this cloud and container environment it should be horizontally scalable and highly available. Let us now take a quick visual at how this looks like. Here are a few applications that we listed out. These are not an exhaustive types of applications, but a few samples of how applications look like prior to RMS being introduced. Now, the first application you notice is in pink, where the role responsibility mappings are stored in a local database, while user role mappings come out from an entitlement system that exists outside. The application holds the entire logic to evaluate the policy and make decisions. It connects to other integrated services in order to get its information. In the second example in blue, you notice that the user role mappings are stored locally and the application still holds the logic to um, evaluate policies. However, it could connect to an external role system to get some role responsibility mappings and some custom services for some other reasons which can help it evaluate. Now, uh, you notice that it still connects to some integrated services. The third and fourth systems are similar. The third system is where everything, all data is localized within your local database. Application still holds the logic to perform evaluations and can connect to integrated services. And the fourth example, which is very similar to the third, the only difference being that it could use an external rules engine, external to the application, to evaluate certain policies. What are the drawbacks of using all these different techniques? You notice that your policies are decentralized. You notice that auditing is now on a per application basis because everybody does things differently and user management is extremely bespoke, especially in examples 2, 3 and 4 where user role mappings are localized in your own database. How do we go about solving this? Let us visualize the solution. The first thing we notice is in post RMS, the database does not contain any user role mappings or role responsibility mappings. The application logic is sheerly business logic and nothing else. The evaluation has been deferred to an RMS client, RMS standing for Responsibility Management System, which connects to an RMS, a Responsibility Management System, which provides for a centralized role service across the organization. So role responsibilities and user roles are now centralized. In addition, the Responsibility Management System connects to integrated services on the application's behalf. And the most important aspect, the Responsibility Management System provides a policy engine that can evaluate policies that are set about for your domain or application. These policies can further connect to systems that are provided by your organization in order to evaluate whatever data and policy needs to be evaluated. This is what we want to achieve. What are the benefits of doing this? I mean, you now have centralized policies, you have centralized auditing of course, and you have centralized user management. This is a win. How do we go about doing this? How do we architect a solution for responsibility management? Before we go there, how do we understand responsibility management as a life cycle? So let's take a quick look. We have responsibility management to this. It's got a policy life cycle. You first create policies and you obviously have to store such policies. This process of creating and storing policies is called policy administration. And then you have a phase where such policies need to be distributed to services or applications that can run and evaluate such policies. 
This distribution or dissemination is a phase that follows after authoring. The third phase is where you actually use these policies. You use them to evaluate. This is the job of a policy engine. This phase is known as a policy decision or evaluation phase. This is followed by an enforcement where the service or application that is looking for the data or the result of a policy evaluation is using it. Therefore, it's a usage phase. This is your normal cycle. However, over a period of time, you definitely have changes in either reference or static data or in the policies themselves, which leads you to a policy reconciliation or maintenance phase. The outcome of this reconciliation could be a change in the policy, which goes back to a policy administration phase and the cycle continues. This is what is a very high overview of how policy life cycles exist. There is a much detailed flow in the appendix. If time permits, we will go through that as well. What were the technology choices we used to build this? So we'll first start by looking at uh, three different technology choices that were very important to us. The first one being the payload format. Our intent was to expose query-only operations. Policy decisions are non-mutating, so it should be simply get operations. However, get operations do not support a request body, and one of our requirements was to have a request body uh, to be able to process incoming service uh, inputs. Now, get operations are also exposed to character limits, so large content was not possible in query parameters. So our logical choice was to use a post operation instead of a get. Why post? Because post does not support meaningful cache. Now, we do not want cache data. Another thing that we found out was that JSON and individual query parameters were turning out to be quite verbose. We decided to trim that down by investigating further and found a, tool, found a payload format, HOCON, which fit our needs. HOCON stands for Human Optimized Configuration Object Notation. Here is a link where you can find out more information about HOCON. Let's dig a little bit into HOCON real quick. HOCON is a low ambiguity, simple syntax uh, payload format. It is a superset of JSON. JSON is completely parsable by HOCON parsers. In addition, HOCON allows the use of comments and multi-line strings, which are very beneficial. And HOCON allows for includes and substitutions. We'll take a look at that in the next slide. HOCON additionally has built-in durations, which help a lot with readability and also trimming down your verbosity. Let's take a look at those two later. Here is an example where we have substitution and inclusion. In generic.conf, one of the files, conf being the standard extension for HOCON files, HOCON standing for Human Optimized Configuration Object Notation, these are simple text files, standard extension is .conf, you could change it to whatever you want. In a generic.conf, I have x declared as 10, and y is declared as $x. I am using substitution here. And z is declared as a five second duration, and we will take a look at that later. Here, this is an example of substitution. In my.conf, the second file that I have, I declare an attribute A that includes generic.conf. So I now have the ability to include other content. And you notice that if I evaluate my conf, I get a.x is 10, a.y is 10, and a.z is 5 seconds. Now the benefit is immense because my the data that my service consumer has to supply can be greatly trimmed down if there is existing content that I could hold on the server or in some reference data and just depend on it to be made available during evaluation. That helps a lot. That was one of the features of Hocon that we heavily relied on. Moving on, here is a sample comparison between a JSON payload and a Hocon payload equivalent. On your left, you have a foobar bars in JSON where bars has a my value. Its equivalent in Hocon is a one-liner with a dot convention or with a curly brace convention. You notice that the colons are actually optional in Hocon for complex structures. The second example is for an employee where you notice that the employee colon is replaced without the colon in case of Hocon. Uh, you have a first name and last name that is common. And in the nested block, I have a login timeout in milliseconds, that is 5,000, whereas in case of a Hocon, I can simply pass it a login timeout and specify 5S or 5,000 MS. This greatly benefits readability, and it also reduces verbosity as is visible. The fourth example that I wanted to share was full name, where there is data duplication between first name, last name, and full name. In case of a Hocon, I could simply use substitutions. So there were some benefits we got out of Hocon and made a use case for us to try and use that instead. In addition, on our backend, we looked at Java being our backend. 
and we were looking for memory efficiency and performance and immutability. So our choice was to use a collections library that provided us those and we decided to settle on Eclipse Collections. Here is a link to Eclipse Collections down below where you can read more about it. It provides for immutable hierarchies and memory efficiency and also has optimized eager APIs that improve readability. The third and most important decision we had to make was that of a policy engine. We decided to use Open Policy Agent, which is an open source general purpose policy engine. It uses Rego, Rego formats, which are very similar to Go language. They are a declarative native query language. Policies are written as rule sets. Rule sets look very similar to functions. Um, the moment you write these functions and run OPA, these policies get exposed automatically as post operations. You don't have to do anything with that. In addition, OPA also provides you an ability to update data and policy using put operations. We chose not to use that. Um, OPA can also be launched as a library for a service, an independent daemon, or as a sidecar. A sidecar is essentially something that is baggaged alongside your service. So wherever you start your container with your service, an instance of OPA would also start since it is a sidecar. Our decision was to use a sidecar. There is a link below to read more about Open Policy Agent. How does Open Policy Agent work? You notice the service consumer made a call and they passed in an endpoint that ends in allow. So they're looking for an allow or denial of access. And this allow corresponds to a policy which has a rule set for allow. So they invoke the service rather than open policy agent. And the service simply acts as a router and passes that information to the sidecar on the local host. The payload included by the consumer is an input hook on package. And in this, you notice that they specify a bucket, a client, and an access. And they're looking for allow for this set of data. Our reference data made available to us has bucket information with clients who are allowed to do some kind of activity on it. You notice that bucket two has client specified and one of the clients is client one with the read access. The policy itself is quite simple where there is a default allow equals false, which means if no condition is met, it would return a false. However, if any bucket in that data matches the input bucket and client name matches the client name and the access matches the client access requested, it would return a true. In this case, we get a true back. How do we go about designing such a solution? We just saw how open policy agent work. We saw the technology choices. Here is our first version of the architecture. Domains have developers. Developers using their source control and build CI tools create policies in store them into a rule repository. This is an SDLC approved process. Uh, it is very similar to writing any other code and you basically harness the power of the CI server and write into a rule repository which is nothing but a Maven repository and we will take a look at that shortly. Each domain has their developers developing multiple policies. On the RMS side, we created a fronting for all our integrated services Active Directory, LDAP, User Service, and Role Service, and made it available as a policy information point service. On top of that, we have a responsibility management wrapper, which is exposed to our service consumers. And responsibility management, in addition, has a sidecar for open policy agent. There is a release train process, which periodically queries and gets new rules stored in the rule repository and uses them to evaluate policies. The service consumers pass in their ad hoc inputs to responsibility management, which in combination with the rules that were recently pulled in and the integrated data that it gets, the reference data and static data that it gets from the policy information point could evaluate these um, queries and return back a proper result. Now there were some drawbacks we found with this model. Uh, number one, information barriers were missing. So any service could call any other policy. Any rogue policy script could lead to a loss of service for all domains. It was all eggs in one basket. Therefore, responsibility management became the gatekeeper for testing and coverage. Uh, we also had to establish a release train model to pick up new policies. It was on a periodicity basis. Obviously, that doesn't work all the time. And there were in out of band policy change requests, which led to intermittent service unavailability. These were most commonly found when new domains onboarded because of the difference in either data or logic between production and non-production systems. Now, we decided to overcome these and create a new architecture. Here is a distributed version of the responsibility management service. 
Most of the content that you saw in the earlier slides still remains. Developers still produce their policies and write them to rural repositories. We still have a policy information point. Uh, we still connect to most of our integrated services. However, role service moved down below. Let's take a look at why. We now have what is called a policy administration service. This service allows for domains to update role responsibility mappings and user role mappings. So now through some um, APIs, the domains have the ability to update role responsibilities and user roles, and such updates are written to the role service. So we now have a CRUD model for our role service as well. This is something that was not possible in the first version of the architecture. Role service, once updated, rehydrates the policy administration service with the latest data. And this is useful. We'll take a look at why. Instead of there being a release train process where we were periodically picking up rules from a rule repository, now the domain has the ability to publish its policies. So they have full control on when policies get pushed out. Each domain sends out a request, and this request includes the coordinates for the rule uh, in the rule repository, and those get picked up and sent to the policy administration service. The policy administration service takes the policies takes the appropriate roles and user role mappings for the time when the policy was published, packages it into a bundle, and pushes it into a policy bundles repository. So a policy bundle comprises of your role responsibilities, user roles, and policy information that was authored by the domain developers. There is now a policy distribution service, and this distribution service is the consumer of the policy repository. Now, instead of there being a centralized Sidecar in responsibility management service, the sidecars are now moved into the for the individual services. So services now run a sidecar of open policy agent and consume information from the policy reference data endpoint and also consume policy bundles from the policy distribution service. So evaluations for a given service are made at their own sidecars and not made centrally. It is no longer a federated, rather a distributed system. Now, there were some immense benefits we got out of this. Uh, segregation and information barriers were automatically covered for us. The impact of a rogue script was only on the specific domain that needed that policy. Gatekeeping became the task of the domain rather than on RMS. Um, the new policies do not require a release train model. A domain can push policies on demand. Ad hoc policy changes only impacted those who needed that new policy. And in addition, we got a cool feature of being able to get implicit role-based access control support because we now could update role responsibilities and user role mappings. What is a policy bundles repository? It's a quick refresher of what we already talked about. It contains your policy files, it contains your policy static data, and it contains helper functions that we actually authored because we found them commonly used across multiple domains. So we provide that as an add-on that you could simply add and reuse within your own policy making. Here is how policy bundle looks like in, in actuality. These are very similar to Maven coordinates. You have a domain, a policy, and version, which are akin to a group ID, artifact ID, and version in Maven and you can have several policy bundles under that. As an example, for domain one, you have policy one, you could also have policy two, three, and four. You have version 1.0.0, a semantic version. You could have multiple versions of the policy. And if within each version, you could have one or more bundles. These bundles are something created by the policy administration service. And here is a visual of how it looks like when expanded. Here is your bundle that contains all the data that was fetched from the role service the policies written by the domain developer, and all helper policies that we create that you can reuse. We provide both the API as well as an implementation version of both. Now, once again, here is the distributed version as a refresher in case anyone had any questions about that. How did we set up the policy agent? Um, we downloaded the executable. It is freely available from openpolicyagent.org. Uh, we set up a configuration standard, and we created a simplified Docker command. Let's take a look at the configuration itself. The configuration is located at a dollar config path. This will be useful later. And in here, we mention the services that can author the policies and where they would be found. This is the distribution service URL. So there is a specific URL tied to this particular service. 
In addition, it specifies what the bundle name is, the coordinates for the bundle, as a very similar to Maven coordinates, and the services that can consume that bundle. So we actually have entitlements on which service can consume what bundles. The Docker command is quite simple. It uses an exec, launches SOPA, and provides the config path that we just created. Here is a sample where we have a library that we created um, and it is reused. We have an RBAC policy library that contains a user has responsibility rule set or function which performs some activities. The application policy can simply consume the policy library rule sets by invoking them and it has a default of false and if the user has a responsibility it would return a true instead. Now, allow is one verb. We could use many verbs. I just shared allow because of something we already talked about. Here are some sample data files this particular application policy may have encountered. You have application user with responsibilities on certain resources and actions and its membership. And you also have application admins and its responsibilities, resources, actions, and membership. These are two examples of data. There could be several other data JSON files provided for RBAC. I just show you, share two here. Last but not the least, what I wanted to talk about is an IDE productivity tool. We built out an IDE productivity tool for IntelliJ. Uh, it's a functional yet work in progress policy editor. It parses and validates OPA policy files and it relies on the OPA language reference which is linked below. Uh, it can be customized for color themes, so let's quickly walk through this. Um, here is an example where on the left you notice that there is an in, there, we've opened a policy file in IntelliJ and there is an error on line 12 because it's missing a double quote. IntelliJ does not give me any visual cues about it. After applying the plugin, however, you notice that I now have a cool logo, I have my syntax highlighting, and I actually show some error on line 15 because there was something wrong on line 12. And you also notice that in the gutter, you get some exclamation marks saying you have an error. Now, if you hover over that error, it gives you something more meaningful and tells you that it got a uh, double quote when it wasn't expected, which means that there was some issue somewhere. Let us assume we fix this error now, and you notice that the gutter icon now turns green, green ticks, and you have fixed the error, so you get wonderful syntax highlighting throughout. In addition, we also created a settings for this. The settings uh, allows you to customize and theme it for either dark or light themes that IntelliJ users seem to prefer. And the intent is for us to open source this in the near future. We are looking to clean it up, polish it up a bit, and open source it. That's what I wanted to cover today. Uh, in summary, responsibility management can solve a lot of the issues that we first started off as scenarios. The choice of a payload format is important. Choice of an architecture is vital because in some situations, a federated would work better than distributed. In our case, it was not so. A distributed policy engine, in our case, alleviated back pressure and volume demands and reduced outages and maintenance related downtimes. And last and but not the least, creating a policy editor plugin helped boost productivity for us. That's, thank you for attending my session. Uh, have a great day.